right, wonderful, wonderful. If you don't mind, let's um, open our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we're going to continue our study um, in the book of Acts, Contagious Boldness. Um, if you don't have a Bible, as Garrett shared, there's a Bible underneath um, right in front of you in one of the chairs, and I want to follow along. And we're going to do a lot of reading, good amount of reading this morning. There's some things I know we're going to read, and then there's some things I don't know. Um, two times this week, to, um, I wouldn't say the Lord, I don't know how it happened, but all my notes got erased twice. Um, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> But it happened, and like, Lord, why is that? Even yesterday, what yesterday was one of the times I was just like, well, all right, whatever the case might be. But a wonderful passage of scripture that we're going to take a look at um, this morning. Um, as I'm thinking, ladies and gentlemen, there are some people, I don't know, I was just sitting here and I was listening to those songs, just crying and weeping. Um, there are some people um, in this sanctuary that you are struggling in life. And one of the things we're going to see um, in this text, ladies and gentlemen, that there's a continuous pointing to Jesus. There's a continuous pointing to Jesus. One of the things I'm always mindful of, I learned when I first got saved, I was sitting down, and it's a while ago, this is Jim, I don't even know his name, there's this cassette tape, so you guys know how long ago that was, right? But there was this cassette tape, and there's this man walking through this series about G teaching on Jesus being God. And one of the things this man um, said over and over again, he said, oftentimes when you're having conversation with people, right, and debates about religion, one of the things that people oftentimes try to do is steer you away from Jesus. They'll take the conversation and they'll take the conversation in another direction instead of staying on and focusing on Jesus, and so this morning, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a look at here, guys, is we have Peter and John, they've been walking through some challenging times, and they're being told not to speak in the name of Jesus, but we're going to see what Peter and John, what they're going to continuously do is they're going to point the people back to Jesus. So listen to me, as a church, our number one answer is Jesus. If there is no Jesus, you don't sit in this sanctuary this morning. If, if there's no dying on the cross, forgiveness of sin, resurrection, we don't sit in this sanctuary this morning. Salvation, he says here at the end of, of chapter 3, that there's only salvation and only one name under heaven which a man can be saved, and that name is who? Jesus. So listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, it's very important that we stay focused and that we don't lose sight of where salvation comes from because salvation comes from only one name, Rob, and that name is Jesus. Let's get to the points. First slide. All right, so a couple of key points. Um, what we're going to see here, I kind of touched on the first one, that the apostles' focus is on who? The man, Jesus. We're going to walk through a couple of things, some things that Garrett shared a couple of weeks ago. We're going to walk through and, again, point to who? Jesus. We're also going to see Peter, and I would say John's as well, but specifically Peter's transfer transformation because there's a transformation that the Lord takes Peter through. We're going to see this boldness and this strategy in a sense of how Peter walks and how he, how he engages the religious leaders. The other thing we're going to take a look at and we're going to see here is the Sanhedrin Council. So something is said here, in all my years of studying the book of Acts, I saw something this week. I was like, this is a big deal. We're going to see the difference of the Sanhedrin Council and then the Jerusalem Council because the Jerusalem Council, what I've just been sharing, the constant focus is on God. This is what God said. This is what God has done. This is what God has said. This is what God has done in the name of Jesus. Then, ladies and gentlemen, as I shared, there's one name above all names. And what's that man's name? Jesus, the man. No matter where you are, no matter what salvation you need, and what I mean salvation, deliverance from the power of sin, deliverance from whatever it is that you're going through, you know what? The Bible is very clear. There's only salvation in one name, and his name is what? Jesus. 
Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. I do pray and ask, Lord, speak to your people. Lord, would you take hold of our minds, our hearts, Lord, and just speak to us. Would you cause these words, in one sense, to jump off these pages into our heart? Lord, the things that we are wrestling with, the things we have yet to lay at your feet, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would just speak through your word, Lord, and speak to your people, cause us, not just your people, me too, cause us to lay these things at your feet, and by your word, may we stand on your word, and as we stand on your word, abide in your word, Lord, that we would be able to walk in the freedom, as your word says, as Christ has set us free for freedom's sake, may we walk in that. Lord, as we look at Peter's life, John's life, as we look at the Sanhedrin, Lord, open our minds, Lord, educate us. Speak to us, train us in this moment, in this time, Lord, that we would be more like your son, Jesus, as we leave this sanctuary this morning. And may one name above all names be high and lifted up in this place. We love you. We honor you and praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Chapter 4, verse 13, when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated or untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them, clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But, so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking any, to anyone in this name again, the name Jesus. So they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way of punishing them because... The people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For the sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years. Verse 13, let's break it down. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed. And then they recognized some, there's some recognition here that what? They had been with who? With Jesus. Couple of things here. One, the disciples are identified as being one bold, however, seen as what? Uneducated and untrained. This word bold has this meaning to have freedom in speaking, unreservedness in speech. So think about this. Here, here it is. Peter has already addressed them in the, in the last chapter, in chapter 3, right? And also in, in, in the beginning of chapter 4, he has addressed the Israelites. He says, this is why Jesus has come. So he's standing before them, and now he's standing before the Sanhedrin, these leaders, with boldness and just freedom of speaking the truth. Speaking what? Speech openly, frankly, without concealment. Free and fearless in confidence. So as Peter is speaking to them, he says here, listen, we have identified that they speak with what? With boldness, with confidence. It's one thing, noble. When you know that you know that you know and you stand and you've seen it and you heard it, you're able to do what? Stand on it. And so this is what Peter is saying. They say, you know what? We have seen that these men are what? They're bold. Now, throughout the rest of this chapter and next week, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see this, this element of them being bold. And one of the things after the Sanhedrin deals with them and then they go, we're going to see next week, what do they do? They come back together, right, and they pray for boldness. And we'll see that next week. But again, this boldness. Then he said that they were also what? Uneducated. They have this meaning of they're illiterate or unlearned. 
So think of the Sanhedrin, these religious leaders saying that, you know what, these men, they're illiterate, they're unlearned. Also has the meaning, they said that they're also what? Untrained, right? So what does this mean? When he said untrained, it has this meaning of a private person as opposed to a magistrate or ruler or king. So when I read that, what I think of, ladies and gentlemen, what they're saying, when he says that, you know what, they're untrained, they don't have position, they don't have power. They're not in this position when it comes to the city or when it comes to Jerusalem. They're not in that type of position. They're untrained. It also has this meaning of a common soldier as opposed to a military officer. So again, this untraining has has this context, guys, where it comes with position. And really, when you think about this, guys, it's important to take note because we're going to take a look at these leaders. These leaders was about what? Power? Prestige? Their position, a name, because he says, hey, they asked the question, hey, in whose name are you coming and doing this work that you're doing? And what power are you, where are you getting this power from? It was about their power and their prestige. And they sit here saying, you know what, we see that you're bold, but we also have this thought that, you know what, you're a little what? Uneducated and unlearned. That behooves me because this is the problem with that. These men, the Sanhedrin, they really don't know who Jesus is. They said that, you know what, at the end, we've seen that you have been with Jesus, but they don't really know who Jesus is. We're talking about the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega. What does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? The beginning and the end, the creator. He was there in the beginning. So if he's the Alpha, the Omega, and they have been trained by him, which we're going to look at, how in the world could you say that he's an unlearned or untrained or, you know, that that makes no sense. And what it tells me, you don't know who Jesus is. I wrote here, no education and training comes close to being trained or educated by Jesus. I think of Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You talk about education? If he's the alpha, the omega, and you spend time with him, and he's the one that educates you, and he's the one that trains you, you have the best education known to man. There is no better education. Now, listen to me. That does not mean don't go to college, don't go to university and get your degree. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, listen, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one that created, the one God that spoke all things into existence, he's the one that educated and trained. There's no better education. Now, some of us sitting here, right, and quote, unquote, you uneducated, you untrained. And what I want to encourage you to do is be careful with that. Some of the most impactful men in America have never even stepped foot in an educational institution. Some of the men and women that run this country has never stepped foot in an educational institution. And sometimes what we're doing, we have to be careful. Listen to me. And I'm talking about me, Garrett, as the church. Even we have to be careful as elders that we don't put these guidelines around men, right, and make them feel less than because they haven't done what we have done. That's exactly what the Sanhedrin did. You think about Matthew chapter 24, 25, I think it's 24, when Jesus tells them, you know what, you religious leaders, woe to you. You tell them to do these things, but you yourself, you're not willing to do it even of yourself. You're empty tombs. Getting back on course here, ladies and gentlemen. They said, you know what? There's a recognition. Yeah, these men are unlearned and untrained, but it's one thing. I recognize that they've been with who? Jesus. When you engage people and you walk day to day, do people say that about you? You might be uneducated, you might be untrained, you might be unlearned, whatever it is in the beginning, but at the end, can they say, but I recognize that you've been with Jesus. It's a big deal. 
Now, a couple of things, just thinking through this, this recognition of them being with Jesus. You think of this education or training, I was just thinking about, all right, what does that look like? You look in Matthew chapter 10, you don't have to turn there, but think about what Jesus summoned the 70, and then he gives them authority. He tells them, go into all the world in, in Mark chapter, at the end of Mark, he says, go into all the world, what did he tell them to do? To preach the good news to every creature, and Lord, I'm with you always. He gave them the message to preach. He told them again, proclaim the kingdom of heaven. Let them know the kingdom of God is at hand. He says, heal the sick. He gives, he empowers them to heal the sick. Leprosy, drive out demons. He says, don't worry about gold, silver, copper, money bags. Why? Because the worther is worthy of his food. He says, when you go into a household, if that household is worthy, stay with them. If not, you know what? Dust it off your feet. He said, you'll be handed over. Think of this. He's talking about education forthright. He tells them here. He says, you know what? You'll be handed over to the Sanhedrin in the synagogues. You'll be flogged in the courts. Where is Peter and John at right now? In the courts. He says, don't worry about what you shall speak, noble, because the Holy Spirit will give it to you. Nobody I've been thinking about you in our conversation, and think about an education. You got the greatest education known to man, Jesus. And the things that the Spirit of God has placed in your heart, Noble, what I would encourage you to do is go do it. Go do it. I haven't seen what you've seen. I haven't heard what you've heard. You do. You know. Go do it. And just trust. Think about this. And you think about this too, Noble. Think about this. We sitting here, these men are sitting, these, these religious leaders are saying they're uneducated and unlearned. Yet, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, you guys know what I'm talking about? Books thousands of years later that you and I, we sit and we do what? We read it. We study it. We live by it. Think about that. John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Think about that. We sit here and we study these books, but yet these men were what? uneducated and unlearned, but they have been with Jesus. And here they are, thousands of years later, ladies and gentlemen, doing what for you and I? Educating us. Writing. Speaking. A couple other things I think that are important just to highlight, because Jesus told them, he says, and this is kind of like some strategy type stuff when dealing with people that you're in conflict with. He says, listen, I'm sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. Think about that. When you ponder that, sheep amongst wolves, how do wolves run? In packs, right? So think, I'm a little sheep, right? And I look outside the gate, who's out there? Wolves, I'm like, man, I ain't, I'm not going out there. There's some fear that comes with that. But think of the song we're just sing, singing. Jesus does what with fear? Come on, y'all. Jesus does what? Silences all fears. But again, again, here we go. This mission sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, that the Lord calls us upon is frightening. Just as sheep knowing they're seeing that wolves are near causes what? Fear and concern. So it causes you to do what? Stay in, right? And if you worry about your education, you worry about looking at you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to stay within. You're going to hold on instead of going out being who God has called you to be and accomplishing the goals and the work and the mission that God has called you to accomplish. Don't do this about the fears. He says, listen, I'm sending you out like, as sheep, uh, like, like sheep amongst wolves. Oftentimes this work, Garrett, this work is beyond ourselves. But in this not necessarily this part, but this work is beyond you. Not necessarily this part, but in this, he says, look, sheep. When you think of sheep, sheep what? Humble. They're gentle. They're docile. And Jesus says, you know, when you talk about education, this gospel education, what he's saying is, hey, there's a context in which I'm sending you out, and I'm sending you out like what? Sheep amongst wolves. Now, in that, be what? Watchful. Because what? Wolves come to do what? Ravagely what? Attack and a pack. And we need to be what? Mindful of that. But I'm sending you out like what? Sheep. I 
<laughs> I wrote my notes. Have you ever seen a sheep or sheep attack wolves? Never, huh? Think of how often we, when we're, somebody offends us, are we not on the same page that we go on to what? Attack. Ah! No, no, no. I'm sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. Lastly, remember this. Wolves are meant to attack. They're meant to roam in packs the way that they are. So when you're thinking about this conflict that Peter and John is with these religious leaders, same thing with you. You should have an expectation of a sinner to do what? Sin. You should have that expectation. The mindset of some of the people, you should have that. That's what they're supposed to do because this is a key thing. The only way you and I are any different is because of the Spirit of God. That's it. It's the grace of God. So you should have that expectation of those wolves. Lastly, I think, Jesus says, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as what? Serpents. Hmm. So be shrewd as serpents. So Jesus tells us to be shrewd. What does that mean? To, he says serpents are what? Subtle. They're crafty. Mm. Subtle and crafty. I, they're, they're easily walked upon. Anybody ever walked up on a snake and didn't realize it? Anybody? I remember, I think it was the 4th of July, was out on a walk out um, at a lake, right? And we're just walking around, walking around. And then somebody says, hey, do you... Just walked up on it. But I think about that. Are you as a Christian easily, are you, are you able to be easily approached? There's a flip side to that. Can people just approach you and engage you? Or do people look at you as a Christian, right? And they say, man, that dude is poisonous. I don't have anything to do with him or her. The things that come out of their mouth is not gospel. The things that come out of their mouth is just poisonous. The other thing that snakes do, they camouflage themselves and adapt their colors to the environment. Oof. Are you adaptable? Can you and just engage with people that's unlike you? that have different beliefs or thoughts than you do, that was raised different than you are, or were, excuse me, but they camouflage. Now, listen to me, because some of you, you sitting here and you saying, all right, well, you're saying that we should adapt. What I'm not saying is not conform. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying conform to those ways, but can you adapt so that you can engage? Man, I got a lot more with these snakes. Uh, one thing it says about the snake that its ability to disconnect its joints and slither into places that it needs to be into. Mm. Why you say wow? Who said wow? <laughs> Why you say wow? That's. Mm, 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 mm. So disconnect. Not compromise, not step away from who you are in Christ, but can you disconnect, right? Think about this. I always think about this, and Peter's on this process, ladies and gentlemen. Each one of us have, have a different process of sanctification. That's just it. It's oftentimes what we don't do, guys, we don't allow people just to walk through their process of sanctification. We want to beat them up and make you be like what I think you should be. No. I'm not God. I didn't die for you. You didn't die for that individual. And so in that, ladies and gentlemen, disconnect so that you can be where you need to be at. There's one more and last one that I have to share, I think. Oh, yes. It is said that snakes sometimes spend up to 10 hours, again, up to 10 hours, right, dissecting their prey. I'm just going to sit. I'm just going to watch. I'm just going to watch. How does that prey operate? And then, bam, hit them. 
But think about it. Oftentimes, instead of us, as the Bible says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, we're the what? Complete opposite. As soon as you say something, bam, I'm getting you. But serpents, sometimes, you know what? It's 10 hours. They just sit there. Eating. They just sit there, sweetie, and they just watch. And then when it's time to pray, bam. That's what Jesus said that we should be like. And then innocent as doves, gentle, innocent, harmless, clean. It's hard to fathom ourselves as serpents, but I didn't say it. Jesus said it. So, in transition, the greatest education and training known to man is from who? The king of kings. These men, they're educated by the king, the alpha, the omega, the creator. You read in Colossians chapter 1, won't go into it, but who is he? He's the king. There was nothing before him that was made, that was made, and all things were made for him. Here's the question, ladies and gentlemen, that I propose for you. And Larry, here's a question for you. When people engage you, what is that commentary? At the end of it, do they say, you know, he or she is this, but I recognize that he or she has been with who, Jules? Jesus. Crazy part. You think of Peter and Peter's transformation, and I'll just... We're just pondering on this, and you, you think of just this process that Peter is walking with, and you, back in John 18, you think of when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, the Bible says in verse 10, he says that Simon Peter, who had a sword, what did he do? He drew it and what? Stuck the high priest, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Micaiah, and then at that, um, at that, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Some of us in here need to put your sword away. There's a way you utilize a sword. And there's a time. The Bible says there's a time for there's a time for everything under earth known to man. And we see Peter here. What does Peter do? He pulled that sword off and what? Ha! But we know the Bible says what? What did Jesus do? Bam! But what did Jesus respond? What did Jesus say to him? Jesus said what? At this time, Jesus Peter, um, at the, um, said to Peter, put your sword away. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Sometimes we run from the trials and tribulations of life. And we pull out that sword and we want to fight. Maybe it's just a time for you to walk through that trial. Maybe it's something that God is trying to do in your life. But early on, what would Peter do? Pull out that sword. Quick to speak. Chop you up. We see a different Peter here. Because um, early on in chapter 4, when you look in um, chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says then Peter was what? Filled with the Spirit. And then he spoke to the rulers and the, and the people there. He's filled with the Spirit. This is a different Peter. He's been empowered by the Spirit. Verse 14, and since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition so the religious leaders, they couldn't say anything. They observed this boldness of Peter's speech and how Peter is standing on the gospel regardless of the religious leaders and their position and their power over, quote, unquote, Peter and John. But they realized they were, what, uneducated, untrained, but really Peter had to, John had the greatest education and the greatest training known to mankind. Verse 15, it says, after they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through, the, through them, excuse me. And what? It is clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and guess what? Even we as the religious leaders, as the Sanhedrin, we cannot what? We can't deny this. 
What is done is done. Here's the man. And this is the thing, guys. Think about, well, actually, I'll get off course. I'll come back to that later. Here it is. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin. So what is the Sanhedrin? Um, let me have a slide there, please. Some may know this, some may not. A great council at Jerusalem consisted of 71 members sometimes. And also there was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there was a lower tier of 23 or 21 members as well. Scribes, elders, prominent members of the high priestly families. And the high priest, the president of the uh, assembly, which was the high priest, the most important causes were brought before the tribunal. And as much as the Roman rulers of Judea had left it to the power of trying such cases and also a pronoun pronouncing sentence of death with the limitation that a capital sentence pronounced by the Sanhedrin was not valid unless it was confirmed by the Roman procurator. So in that, really, they didn't even have power. But in Jerusalem, that was the Sanhedrin. This was the power made up of Pharisees, right? These religious leaders. Now, the Bible says here, and it's important, let's read this because as I was reading this, it's something that just like, bam, just stood out to me. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they confirmed among themselves, saying, what should we do with them? This word conferred, I think I have this slide, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, do I have a, this word conferred? Because I think it's important. To come together, so this is the Sanhedrin, and what we're going to look at here, guys, is this difference of the Sanhedrin um, council and the, and the Jerusalem council. And when it comes to the church, hear me, I want all your eyes. When it comes to the church, we as the church are not to operate as the Sanhedrin council does. When it comes to the church, we're to operate as the Jerusalem council does, and we're going to take a look at that. But here, this is what they did. They conferred, right, to come together, to meet, to encounter in a hostile sense. What's that last part? To what? Fight one another. Hmm. Think of that. That's the, that's the for whatever reason, that's the term that's used. I looked at that, I'm like, that's pretty interesting. But look at the, let's look at, let's look at the fruit of this because, in verse 17, I'm going to come back and we'll highlight this, but it's important to understand based upon what this word says and what this word means, listen, look what comes out of that. It says, but so that this does not spread any further among the people, let's what? Threaten them. So there's threats. Also in verse 21, after threatening them. Actually, you turn to, uh, where is it? This is, man. Man. Actually, it's in chapter 5. This is this part. Chapter 5, verse 17. Then the high priest rolls up. This is after signs and wonders are being done. He and all who were with him, who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, and they were all filled with what? Jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. Hmm. Jump over to verse 29. Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than people again. And he goes out and he lays out this gospel. But then you go down to verse 33. And again, this is this mindset of these religious leaders that come to do what? To fight in a hostile sense. This is what they're, I didn't even say this. One of the ways that they described the Sanhedrin was uh, the, the supreme Jewish court, the supreme Jewish court, but this is the foundation. When they came together, when they came to confer, it's to encounter in a hostile sense to fight with one another. Here's the foundation. I hope you guys are listening because this is vital. One, they jealous. Two, verse 33 in chapter 5, look at, look at their response to when Peter, after Peter shares the gospel with them again. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to what? Kill them. That's the mindset. This is the religious leaders that were leading the people in Jerusalem. The foundation. When I think of this, again, you've heard me say it, I say it all the time, what the religious leaders were worried about, their position in Jerusalem, the power that they had over the people in Jerusalem, their prestige. All of this was being threatened. 
So as it was being threatened, you know what they did back? They threatened back. Let's threaten them so that they no longer speak the name of Jesus. Why? Because in Jesus' name, there's what? Salvation. There's deliverance. God takes care of the Sanhedrin. God takes care of the, you know what, this great supreme Jewish court. God takes care of that. And we'll see that in the next chapter because what the people do, instead of, you know what, fighting, what do they do? They go, Lord, we need, hey, we need, we need boldness. They drop to their knees and they pray. They seek the king of kings. They seek the one that has educated them, the one that is the beginning and the end, the one that knows everything that takes place in between all that. They say, you know what, we're just going to lift up our voices and we're going to seek him. Now, they ordered them to lead the Sanhedrin. They conferred amongst each other. We saw what it is, what the foundation of this conferring was about. Yet, what I would present to you today, ladies and gentlemen, is God's word. And with God's word in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, if you don't mind, let's turn there, please. There's debate about how man should be saved. And there's major debate. And as they debate, they come together in in verse 6. But before I look there, this is why we're looking here, okay? Well, actually, in verse 6, it says, The apostles and the elders gathered together to consider this matter. What is the matter of how a man shall be saved? Now, this is why I present these two elements to us, ladies and gentlemen, because we saw right before how the Sanhedrin came together and the mindset and the heart behind it. Well, here the Bible says the apostles and elders gathered to consider a matter. Can you pull that slide up, please? To consider or to look into, to see with one's eyes, to see with the mind, and to perceive, to perceive, to know and to see. Again, as I look at this see, remember, one of the things that Peter and them are going to say at the, at, at the end of this text here that we're studying is, you know what, we can't help but speak the things that I've seen and that I've heard. I can't help it to become acquainted with by experience, to experience or take heed or to beware, to take care for, or excuse me, to care for, to pay, take heed to a thing, to show myself appear. And then I just wrote in there, this comes with great responsibility. And what is the responsibility? It is the gospel. And what we're going to look at, guys, is how they handle, there is an issue, and with this issue, they all came together. Paul and Barnabas was asked to come back to Jerusalem to the council, and they said, what we're going to do, we're going to sit down, and we're going to have an honest debate. And we're going to do, we're going to look into this thing. We're going to see, we're going to take careful heed. The number one thing you're going to see in here is that we're going to honor and glorify God with this debate. Let's read. It says here in verse 7, it says, um, this is Acts 15, verse 7. It says, after there have been much debate... Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you're aware in the early days that what? God made a choice among you. If you write in your book or highlighting, God made. I highlighted that. This is why we're reading this because the focus is God. The focus is the gospel. God made a choice among you. That by my mouth, by, by the, my mouth, the Gentiles will hear the gospel message and what? Believe. Verse 8, how does it start off? And who and God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them what? The Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He says, verse 9, he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen, when there's conflict, there's no distinction between you and them. Jesus is the one that does what? Cleanses the heart. Now then, why are you testing God? Here it is again. What's the focus? God. Why are you testing God by putting a yoke on the disciples' necks that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we are what? Saved through grace, 
of the Lord who? Jesus. It's Jesus. Only one name under heaven, ladies and gentlemen, that a man shall be saved. It is the name of Jesus. The whole assembly became silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describe what? All the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James responded, brothers, listen to me. Simon reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. If you don't mind, go back to Acts chapter 4, please. Here's the the contrast. In verse 15, they conferred among who? Come on, y'all, talk to me. Among themselves. What do we see in Acts 15? Who are they seeking? God. This is what God has done. This is what God has said. This is the purpose of Jesus coming. Complete difference, ladies and gentlemen. And it's important that you and I, and we see Peter, right? He's sitting here before these Sanhedrin and these men, their minds, right? It's all about what? Jealousy. They want to kill them, right? All because of a difference of what? They want their power. They want their prestige, right? They want a name for themselves instead of giving glory and honor to the name above all names, ladies and gentlemen. And it's no different from you and I. And so even as a church, it is important that you, and when I say the church, let's, let's simplify this. Y'all like that, huh? Let's simplify that, right? Let's simplify it. You are the church. And when it's time for counsel, you know where you should get that counsel from? Right here. Right here. You can confer amongst yourselves. And don't get me wrong, the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there's what? Wisdom. But hopefully that wisdom comes from who? From the Lord. But when it's all said and done with, these men conferred amongst themselves. And so what comes out of this? Threats, a desire to kill, jealousy. Why? Because it's all about them instead of it being about who? The king of kings, the Lord of lords. Hmm. So, verse 17, we'll close out here in a couple minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 17, it says, but so that this does not spread any further among the people, let us do what? Let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So, they called for them and ordered them, listen, don't speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. It's a big statement. It's a major statement. I wonder why. And yet Peter and John, they've been speaking. And this is is the problem, ladies and gentlemen. They're looking at the man that has been healed, right, from um, from 40 years old, a man that um, every day they would do what? Take him and bring him where? In front of the temple. And everybody just passed by that man to see him. And what is this man doing? Begging, begging. The focus is on the man and then those men instead of, ooh, the Man, Jesus himself. They tell him, don't speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, then Peter and John answered him, read it is right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God. Guess what? What do you tell them? You make that decision. And you can make a decision on your own, and we know how you make decisions. Your decisions are made with what? Jealousy about yourself? You make that decision on your own, but for for us, for me, what does he say? He says, for we are unable to stop speaking about what we have what? Seen and what we have heard. That gospel education, that gospel training, that they walk day in and day out with who? The king of kings, God himself. And they say, say, listen, I can't help it. Hmm. 
This is he who, or them who has been trained and educated by Jesus. What is their response? We saw him. We heard him. Think Philip, we touched him. We're being, this is, this is their mindset. We're, be, we're being trained by him. We're being educated by him. We have the Holy Spirit. We can't help it. It has to come out. At the end, in verse um, 11 and 12 of chapter 4, this Jesus, this stone rejected by you builders, which has become what? The cornerstone. There is salvation, deliverance. What is salvation? Deliverance, whatever he says. There is salvation in no, uh, no one else. For there is no under other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. So in closing, guys, I have to. I just wrote down. I went back chapter three, chapter four, and just wrote down every reference. And why is it that these people had this mindset? Why? Because they spent time with who? The king of kings. They was with him. Let's go, slides. I'm going to run, run through this. No other name. The name of Jesus, all right, chapter three, verse six, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, what did he tell them? Arise and what? Walk. Verse 13, he says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified who? His servant, what? Jesus. This is what, he, what they're bringing to them. We can't help but to share it. Acts 3, 14, you deny the who? The holy and the righteous one. Who are they referring to? Jesus. Pointing them back to Jesus. Next slide. Acts 3, 15, you killed who? The source of life. Maybe you're in here today, right, and you just feel lifeless. Maybe you feel hopeless. There's a king. His name is Jesus, and he's the source of life. He'll breathe life into you. He'll give you hope. He'll give you vision. He'll restore your heart. He'll bring salvation to your heart. Verse three, chapter 3, verse 16, by faith in his name, Jesus has made this man strong. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given this man what? Perfect health. Acts 3, 18, God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets that what? That the Messiah would suffer for, our, for his name's sake. And then next slide, please. Acts 3, 21, man, this is huge, that the seasons of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Pause. This verse is transforming. Think of this, that the seasons of refreshing may come. Some of you guys in here, you need to be refreshed. In this verse, it's very, very clear how one, as a Christian, as a child of God, or even if you're not, if you would confess, because the verse before that says, repent and believe in Jesus. But as a Christian, here he says that the seasons of refreshing may come how? He gives you the solution. Here's the plan. You know how it comes? From the presence of the Lord. Get in the book, get on your knees. Because Why? And that he may send Jesus who has been what? He's been appointed to you, Kathy. Jesus has been appointed to you. Think about that. That is mind-blowing. The King of Kings, God himself, that created all things, he has been appointed to you. What? So, this is one thing that I do know. Because I pay attention to crowds. And what I'm sharing, some of you guys, I'm boring you. And you know what? No, no, y'all laugh. I, I am okay with that because listen to me. This is what I do know. God's word will not return void. It accomplished that and what he sent it forth to accomplish. And in here, ladies and gentlemen, this is what I'm mindful of, right? I'm mindful of this is that for whatever reason the Lord said, James Gordon, stand on this platform and share this. I'm sharing it for that reason. And there's people in here that need to hear what's being preached and what's being taught. And then some of you listen to me. Trust me. I remember when I first got saved. You remember, I'm the Garrett. I remember this. I would sit at Horizon, and depending on who was preaching or teaching, I would be bored. 
And really where it was at, it was a part of it was because of my lack of, my lack of maturity in the word. There are just things that I didn't understand. So when that individual would preach, I just didn't understand. I'd be like, man. But in here today, this is what I know that I know that I know. Peter has walked through a process of sanctification where he is chopping off ears, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Peter is standing being filled with the Holy Spirit, and what Peter is presenting is the one that has saved him, Jesus. And what Peter is trusting in is not in and of himself, in and of himself, but what Peter is trusting in is who? Jesus. That sounds simple, but really it's not. It's difficult. It's quite difficult. To get on your knees and just pray and trust, you know what, whatever it is that you're struggling with, that God is going to take care of it. Those Gentiles, right, that's raging against you, that you're going to trust the Lord, you're going to get on your knees and you're going to pray, Lord, deal with them. It's difficult. Last verse and I'll close here. He says here, Get out of the way. It says here in verse 21 and 22, it says, after threatening them further, they released them. They found no way of punishing them because the people were what? Giving glory to God over what have been done. For this is a sign of healing. And remember, Jews sought after what? A sign. For this is a sign of healing that had been performed on a man over 40 years. Last two slides in closing. Keep going, please. Um, out of these scriptures, um, I just want the last couple of slides. The verse, yep, John 19. So then Pilate took Jesus, scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault same thing they said about Peter and John. Then Jesus came out wearing what? The crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them what? Behold the man. It's only one. Oftentimes, we focus on the man being healed. It's only one. Sanhedrin, who are they focused on? Themselves. No, 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 no. Behold, there's only one crowns. There's only one crucify. There's only one die. There's only one raised from the dead. There's only one ascended to heaven. There's only one that gives you the spirit of God to allow you to walk in the freedom in which he has set you free. One, the man, Jesus. So in that last slide, if I'm not mistaken, All good, I'll read it. What was the apostles' focus on, ladies and gentlemen? The man, Jesus. Peter, transformation. A whole process from chopping off ears, ladies and gentlemen, to just presenting the facts and the truth. Sanhedrin Council versus the Jerusalem Council. The Sanhedrin Council, it was all about them. Let's confer among ourselves. Yet when it came to the apostles, no, what we're going to do, we're going to gather together. And what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take this and we're going to stand on this. What did God say? What does the word say? Not about me and myself. What does the word say? What has Jesus done? That's what we will stand upon. And remember, it's only one died, raised from the dead, sent it to heaven, powered you by the Holy Spirit that saves a man. His name is Jesus. Jesus. Worship team, come on up. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I pray for the minds and hearts. Lord, first, just actually thank you. 
Thank you for being a faithful God. Thank you for loving us, God, the way that you love us. God, thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, God, that you tabernacle in our hearts. Lord, thank you that even in the midst of struggles, and even in the midst of battles and fights and dealing with religious leaders, those in courts, whatever it is, thank you that even in the midst of that, God, you have given us a plan as your church, how to walk in that and walk through that. And it is through and by the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your people. Lord, thank you that as a church, Lord, we are a people that stands upon your righteousness. We're a people that stand upon your truth. Lord, thank you, Lord, that we're willing to fight and to battle for truth. And I would just pray, Lord, help us and keep us in a place to continue to walk as such. Not to veer to the right, not to veer to the left, but to keep us solely focused on your King, Jesus, God. Protect your people, Lord, and just want to tell you, thank you for loving us, God. Thank you that you don't leave us alone, but you tabernacle with us, you guide us, you direct us. You love us unconditionally. You bless your people. I just want to tell you, God, we love you. We honor you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.